So we're going to continue with the five minute speed presentations. Please post your questions to Slido and please put the name of the researcher speaker in your question and researchers, please go and reply to those questions. So first up, I would like to introduce Chris Beerman from CQU, Enhancing Decision Making in Emergency Management. Thank you. Um, so I'm Chris Behrman. I'm going to be talking to you about enhancing decision making in emergency management. And this is a brand new project. Um, and I'm, I think we're in the running for the cake as one of the new projects. So we're due to begin in about two to three weeks. So I think we're pretty much in line for that. I'm giving the talk on behalf of the research team. Um, Peter Hayes from Central Queensland University, Greg Penny, uh, from Charles Sturt, Jim McLennan from La Trobe University, uh, Rona Flynn from Robert Gordon University in Aberdeen in Scotland, and Phil Butler from Cardiff University in Wales. Now, effective decision making requires sound and timely decisions based on an adequate understanding of the situation a suitable decision-making approach, and the appropriate involvement and others in the decision process. And when we talk about decision-making, we're talking about operational decision-making in the response, tactical, and strategic levels. And I quite like this quote because it emphasizes that the decision-making isn't a single one-off event. It doesn't occur in a vacuum. It occurs as an ongoing set of events. And the other reason I like this definition of decision making is that it also emphasizes other non-technical skills that are closely related to, to, to decision making, situation awareness and communication. Now, the objectives of the project are to develop a broad understanding of current practice and future needs of decision making. So we wanna know what's out there, what people are doing, not just in emergency management, but also in closely related domains like aviation, military, medicine, things like that. Then we want to develop and, un and evaluate a set of training and learning products that support the needs of decision makers operating in a variety of decision making environments. So what we want to do is to create a toolbox of things that help people to make decisions in these operational environments. And we acknowledge that the people are at different stages of that journey and have different levels of resources. And then we want to develop a skill acquisition framework that can help people to know what, when, and how to apply suitable decision-making practice and tools. So that helps people to understand how and when to use that toolbox. So here's the research team. Um, I've introduced the researchers. The core research group are very much at the center of this process. So we're gonna work closely with them to co-create the knowledge from the project. It's very much a joint venture and we're gonna create the products from this project together with that core research group. And then we have a translation and implementation panel who are not just helping us to translate and implement the, the products, but also to act as a reference group for us to make sure that we're not disappearing down rabbit holes. And there is actually a lot of um, experience in emergency management in the research team as well. So we don't draw a clean distinction between researchers and what we used to call end users, we now call stakeholders. Um, Greg Penny, for example, uh, has, a, has a great deal of knowledge in, and has a great deal of experience. He's here in the audience somewhere. Um, Phil Butler was with the London Fire Brigade for 27 years. Um, Mark Thomason, nearly 30 years in emergency management. So there's a lot of experience in the team as well as with our end user group. At the heart of this project is a process called the Human Centered Design Process. And what that does is to essentially iterate around a number of activities. So we specify the user requirements, we understand and specify the context of use, we produce solutions to meet the end user requirements, and we evaluate those designs against the requirements that we set. So that's really the engine room of this process, and that core research group is gonna work very closely with us to iterate around that set of activities. 
Once we've come up with something that, that is uh, sound and we like, we've validated that with our end user groups, we'll take that out to the community more broadly, and then there's that stopping procedure at the end where solutions meet the requirements. And finally, we've got a workshop tomorrow, uh, 9.40 9 a.m. If you're interested in decision-making and non-technical skills, you want to find out more about what we do, um, and you want to become involved in the project, come talk to us. Uh, myself, Peter Hayes, Greg Penny, and Jim McLennan are going to be here, so come talk to us. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Next up, please welcome Chris Morton from DECA, who will be talking about translating extreme fire behaviors for improved bushfire prediction. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, my name's Chris Morton, and I'm a, a, an end user and also a contributor on this project. Uh, and this work has come out of uh, the extreme fire behavior that was observed during the 2019-2020 Black Summer bushfires. And on a number of occasions, intense fires interacted with the atmosphere, resulting in uh, really extreme surface winds, rapid fire spread, and in some cases, fatalities on the fire ground. So as part of the, the NHRA Black Summer Research Program, uh, there were some fire reconstructions undertaken uh, using coupled fire atmospheric modeling, which takes into account the interactions between the fire and the three dimensions of the atmosphere. So, yeah, those reconstructions were undertaken and they were able to explain uh, a lot of those surface wind outcomes and those fire behavior outcomes that we observed on the fire ground. So there's, there's a lot of learnings there. And this, so that work's been complete. This is the next step, and it's actually about translating the findings of that research into a way that's applicable for those working in bushfire response. So we're developing training materials to contextualise those learnings in a bushfire response setting targeted at particular emergency response roles. So uh, the primary goal there uh, on the left, enhance the ability for fire meteorologists or fire mets as well as the Fire Behaviour Analyst Group, or FBANs, to uh, evaluate and communicate key risk factors for ex some extreme fire behaviours. So for some context, in a bushfire response setting, uh, we'll have fire mets, we'll, we'll come to a discussion with some really good information on the structure of the atmosphere for a given forecast period, and then Fire Behaviour Analysts will come to that, that same discussion, and they'll have information about where the fire is, where it's likely to be, uh, you know, this afternoon or tomorrow, and through a collaborative process, those two people in those roles can undertake some analysis and come up with some assessment of the potential for extreme fire behaviour to occur and what some potential scenarios of how that might play out on the ground. Now, the science that underpins these risk assessment processes at the moment, it's very much under development, uh, and similarly, the operational processes for how we think about this is still very much evolving. So this training is certainly not going to provide all the answers there, uh, but what it's really trying to achieve is uh, fire mets and F-bands are having a bit more of a shared language in the way they talk about things, uh, and also having a, a shared set of case studies to draw from and to, to talk about together and to draw some learnings from. So NHRA has uh, procured the services of a learning and development specialist who's uh, working with the lead researcher, Mika Peace, uh, and also end users like myself, fire mets and fire behaviour analysts to bring this together. Specifically, it'll be three e-learning modules for FBANs and fire mets to complete. Uh, the first one is an introductory module that'll walk participants through the principles as well as some of the tools and resources that fire mets and FBANs use to evaluate these risks of extreme fire behaviour and then also communicating that extreme fire behaviour, which is even more important to uh, incident control decision makers and field crews that are going to be dealing with these risks on the ground. And the next two modules, one looks at low level jets and uses a case study approach to walk participants through situations where low level jets have interacted with fire plumes in the past. And similarly, the fire generated vortices 
participants will learn about the risks of these vortices and how they might be able to identify the ingredients when this sort of thing could occur in the future. So it's been great to work with an interdisciplinary team on this uh, and really try to contextualise some pretty detailed science and try to pull actual actionable steps out of it for, uh, that people can use on the day, knowing that the limits on the information that they have when they're in that context. And the modules will be available for F-bands and fire mets before the next bushfire season. And NHRA will undertake an evaluation process. And uh, really, I think one of the questions they're asking is, is this approach of actually going a step further and developing training modules for, uh, for emergency response agencies uh, an effective way of achieving that research utilisation? Uh, thank you very much for your time. Cheers. Thank you, Chris. Next, we'd like to welcome Hamish Clark from Melbourne University, who will be presenting on what makes a good fire simulator. Thank you, Hamish. Thanks very much, Kat. Um, thanks to the organisers for putting this on. It's really nice to be here and see a lot of familiar faces and some new faces too. Um, I'd also like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which I work and, and play these days, the Wurundjeri people. Uh, it's just a make a brief aside, it's also really nice, uh, as Kat said, to see the growing um, uh, Indigenous program within NHRA and beyond that. Uh, so our project is what makes a good fire simulator. Uh, so some of you are going to be very familiar with that, others uh, won't know what a fire simulator is, so I'll very briefly explain. Um, it's a model that aims to represent the spread of fire through the landscape in a dynamic way. So we're interested in things like where a fire starts, where it moves to, what dictates its movement, its intensity. Um, so there's a few of them out there. You might have heard of some of them. Spark is uh, being developed nationally. Phoenix, there's a bunch of other ones. Uh, and with this project, uh, there is this national development process, but we're really interested in fire simulators more broadly. Um, and with any model development process, as I think is clear from the, the, the talks that we've seen today, and as probably all of you are familiar with by now, the science, uh, the natural science that goes into it is only half the story. Uh, and so this project, we're really looking forward to jumping into both the natural science of what makes a good fire simulator, but the social science, for want of a better word, organisational and psychological and all, all the rest of it, for why things get used and why they don't, how decisions get made. Um, so you can come up with a long list of criteria for what matters to you in a fire simulator. Um, come along to our workshop session tomorrow and tell us what you think matters. Uh, accuracy is a pretty important one. Um, we want the fire simulator, simulator to actually represent more or less what we think the fire is going to do. Uh, Speed is another one. We probably can't wait hours, days, weeks, um, at least for some uses. Uh, the scale of the simulator too. So, you know, we have a lot of different processes happening at different scales. What's the right scale there? Um, and then how many bells and whistles do we want? How simple do we want it? So there's a, there's a long list that you could make of these criteria, but in another way, what really matters is how you make sense of that list. So how do you trade things off uh, one from the other? Uh, how much are you prepared to lose in one place to gain in another? And obviously that's going to depend on what people are using it for. Um, so different users, different uses are going to have different lists, different trade-offs. Um, and so the kind of fundamental but tricky question is how good is good enough? When do you cross a threshold and say, yep, we'll use it. No, that's not good enough. Yep, we'll develop it, we'll implement it, etc. Uh, so it's really about engagement here. We're not running a bunch of simulations ourselves. We're really trying to understand as broadly as possible who is using fire simulators, what are they using them for. Um, so that's the name of the game. We're talking about interviews, workshops, surveys. We're really trying to get a good holistic understanding. Um, as I mentioned, it's not purely about the, the technical nature of, of what makes a simulator go, even though that's really important. Um, it's also about the things that affect its use. 
Um, so we'll definitely be getting into that and thinking about learning from broader fields too. So if you've got experience with other simulators or models and why they do or don't get used, it'd be good to hear from you about that as well. Uh, ultimately, we want to improve our understanding of the, the current use and, and the way forward. So what are the gaps? Can we develop standards to say um, what's most important? Um, ultimately, trying to yeah, pave a path to better development. Uh, so thanks to Tom, David and John uh, initially on the project management committee and then a much broader group on the translation and implement implementation panel. And uh, really looking forward to working with the team, uh, Tim Neal, who you've all seen from uh, Deakin, as well as uh, a really great group from the University of Melbourne. Our session's 10.25 tomorrow morning, uh, so I'd love to see you there. Thanks. Thank you, Hamish. Uh, now I'd like to welcome Blythe McLennan to the stage, please, who is a Node Research Manager, and she is providing an overview of a very new project, exploring how we can reimagine emergency management volunteering. Thank you, Blythe. Hello again. Um, so yeah, this is another brand new forthcoming project. It's not yet on our program. It's actually open for expressions of interest right now. Um, this is a project that's dear to my heart personally um, and is an important one for the centre to support. So reimagining emergency management volunteering more than just words is the title. It was initiated as a concept to the centre by the Volunteer Management Technical Group of AFAT and has support of the Workforce Management Group and of the Australian Emergency Management Volunteer Foundation, or forum, sorry. So it builds on previous research and previous consultations and discussions about the future of emergency management volunteering and challenges for the sustainability of that volunteering. So we all know that volunteers are very important to Australia's capability, um, currently and future of capability in emergency management. Many in this room are very well aware that there are pressures and shifts that are impacting on volunteering in Australia generally, um, and especially formal high commitment styles of volunteering that underpin much emergency management volunteering. And that looking ahead, sort of the models and assumptions about volunteering that have underpinned EM in the past aren't going to carry us forward well in the future. So this project has been conceived with a really clear goal in mind, which is to move the sector past discussing challenges for emergency management volunteering and the need to change to support sustainable volunteering and into practical, tangible action to tackle challenges guided by a national volunteer sustainability blueprint. And I'll take the words of one of the members of the VMTG and she um, described how we're stuck in Groundhog Day with volunteering. So there's issues that have been discussed for a couple of decades that are still being discussed, that are still challenges because they are tricky and they are hard and there isn't a magic bullet solution to address them, but we're constantly talking about them. So this project is about breaking that impasse and actually starting to get into some of those issues and to start tackling them. The idea of a national volunteer sustainability blueprint also came out of the VMTG in a workshop they did when they were looking ahead at forward work planning. They initiated a consultation about the idea of developing one and um, got very positive feedback on the concept of doing that. And the purpose um, underneath that idea was to provide national level strategic direction for initiatives to support sustainable volunteering and emergency management over the next 20 or further years to align current and future initiatives towards common shared goals and support national level collaborative actions to address the larger and more complex sustainability issues around volunteering. So that blueprint idea has been kicking around for a while and this project is about underpinning and informing and helping to develop and shape that blueprint. That concept of doing that is supported by the VMTG, Workforce Management Group, AMVF, National Volunteer Associations in EM and Volunteering Australia. And so the work will align with strategic objectives in the national strategy for volunteering that has recently come out from Volunteering Australia as well. 
So the project will endeavour to confront some of these challenges by first designing and then undertaking a collaborative and iterative process that firstly reframes and reimagines emergency vol management volunteering challenges and opportunities in different ways compared to the past to reveal new kinds of solutions and to do that using a scenario planning, foresighting type of approach. It will also identify and then undertake some key pieces of action research. This is research that's focused on seeking solutions to issues that supports volunteers and organisations to engage with and learn from many different perspectives and experiences and to create opportunities to influence the sector towards investing in new innovative and sustainable approaches. And then the third key aim that this project has is to collaboratively work within the sector to develop and refine a national volunteer sustainability blueprint as a living, breathing, working document to guide strategic national level and collaborative action that supports emergency management volunteers as the people, volunteering as the activities and volunteerism as the culture that underpins that work. So this is being rolled out in two phases. So there's a lot of kind of thinking and conceptualising and identifying which of those kind of action research areas are going to, we're going to um, grab hold of and tackle. So the EOI that is open currently is for a design phase for this work. And then in future, we will put um, a, a call out for work to undertake that work. I'm 20 seconds over, and given that my presenters in the last session were spot on all the time, I think I probably owe Kat an apology. <laughs> so that's it. Thanks. It's OK, Blythe. You still have 10 seconds to go. Next, I would like to welcome Gabby Makata to the stage. She's from Deakin University and is exploring the awareness, education, and communication for compound natural hazards. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for, for coming and listening today. So the project that I'm going to present about is one that has, is also an incipient project about to start. Um, and uh, it's a project called Awareness, Education and Communication for Compound Natural Hazards. Um, please do come to our workshop tomorrow to hear more. Uh, it's at 11.30 in, in stream four tomorrow morning. How do I make this move on? Hmm, doesn't seem to move on for me. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so um, as we know, it hardly needs saying that natural hazard events are increasing in frequency and, of course, intensity under climate change. Um, and we know that we, this has been discussed uh, several times yesterday and today that uh, things like awareness and education and, crucially, communication are uh, you know, at the base of people being prepared um, and being able to respond and recover from these kinds of events. Uh, however, there's no established best practice framework for communicating on compound uh, natural hazards with vulnerable communities, which is where this project comes in. So it aims to fill that gap by co-creating a tailored communications framework uh, with communities and with responders as well. Uh, again, this is a, a contested definition, uh, but it's something that the project will work through as well, so how to define compound natural hazards. They've been defined as two or more extreme disaster events occurring simultaneously or successively, um, combinations of extreme events with underlying conditions that amplify their impact, um, and also combinations of events that are not in themselves extreme, but which collectively lead to extreme impacts. So. This project uh, will, first of all, undertake a desktop literature review, so that's academic as well as uh, grey literature, and also looking at current frameworks globally uh, that do attempt to um, underpin communication in this sphere. Um, we will also undertake social research in disaster-affected communities to establish um, communication needs, both before and during and after hazard events. And from that will then emerge uh, a conceptual framework for emergency management and for recovery to guide communication 
um, and to, to underpin that awareness and resilience and preparedness for, for these kinds of events. So um, we have thought very long and hard about where we ought to be doing this. Um, the case study locations have now been selected um, and we've put together a set of criteria in consultation with um, end users um, in a project planning workshop that we had about a month ago. Um, so we have thought about the type of hazard, the geographical spread, um, we want to have social diversity in the, uh, across the different case study locations, um, that there is a local media presence, and I'll explain that in a moment, and also we want to avoid over-researched locations. So we are going with these um, locations, Air in Queensland, Dandenong Ranges in Victoria, and um, Tenterfield in New South Wales. Uh, our social research methodology will include an invited research forum for community members, um, we will uh, also be undertaking a survey um, and semi-structured interviews in the locations where we, where we undertake those case studies. And then once we've written our draft uh, framework, we'll be undertaking online focus groups with the research forum members for feedback so that we can really make sure that it's co-created rather than you know, an imposed piece of work. Um, you might wonder why we're mentioning local media. Local media can really be an important, uh, they can be important advocates within the communities that they serve, and they are often concerned with the needs of those communities and, and advocate for those needs. So we've decided, as some of us as communication uh, scholars and, and practitioners as well, to, um, com you know, to work with local media on the ground. So this project will work with local media to convey the research project to local communities, to explain it to them, uh, to invite participa uh, participation and to, in the end, to disseminate and publish results so that, um, you know, local communities know what, what came out of the project. Uh, so that's the project team. Myself, Erin Hawley, who's here today, uh, Christy Hess, who will be presenting, the three of us will be presenting tomorrow morning, um, and Josh Newton and uh, Tim Neal, who are also here. Uh, so 11.30 tomorrow morning in Stream 4, if you'd like to hear more, or please be in touch. Uh, with any of us. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Caitlin. Next, I'd like to invite Caitlin Adams from Frontier SI, exploring how you can better identify water sources for aerial firefighting. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here at the Forum, it's a pleasure to be here to talk about a project we've recently, uh, pretty close to completing, uh, which is a collaboration between NAFSI, AFAC, uh, Geoscience Australia, and Frontier SI. Frontier SI is a not-for-profit that's focused on big, challenging spatial problems, and we work to collaborate across government, industry, and academia. So because this is a short presentation, I'm going to really walk you through the scenario that prompted this project, and then I'm going to tell you a little about how we approached coming up with a solution and what that looks like. Oh, I went backwards instead of forwards. Great. So, um, this is somebody who needs to understand where they should put their aerial firefighting resources in the landscape. So, um, they do this through a program called ARENA, uh, that NAFSI provide, and really this is about being able to track all of the different assets that exist and the resources available, um, both in planning and in response. So here in this landscape, they can see some water bodies. Water bodies are really useful because aircraft go over them, pick up some water and bring that to the fire. There's some very dry vegetation in that landscape, and so this person is thinking, well, I can put my aircraft near this water body, they'll pick up the water, they'll go to that fire if it happens, Great. Unfortunately, you know, when that fire does happen, they dispatch the aircraft. But if the aircraft gets there and there's no water, they now have to detour, pick up water from somewhere else, and then go to the fire. And that's lost valuable time in actually addressing this, you know, major risk. And so having accurate and up-to-date information about our water bodies in the landscape is really important. So this is important both at planning stages and in operations. And really, at a glance, people need to be able to know, um, you know how much water is there actually in a water body? When did you know, we last know that information? 
And um, you know, how big is that water body? Is it going to be suitable for my aircraft? And it's also useful to understand historical patterns in those water bodies. Now, fortunately, um, Geoscience Australia make a product that has some of this information. It's called the Digital Earth Australia Water Bodies product. Now, at a glance, it does have the size of the water body. It does have the historical availability, but it's not good at exposing those really important pieces of information of when did we last see water and how much water was there actually there. And because we're capturing this information from satellites, you know, we are able to get quite regular updates, and these are the kinds of pieces of information that are actually going to be really useful. So what we did as a project team is we set out to see if we could improve how that information was surfaced. So during our project, we conducted sort of user needs uh, workshops to understand what people were looking for, what kind of information. We then conducted three short development sprints over which we tried to develop our solution. And finally, we tested that with GA and NAFSI to make sure that we'd built something that was actually fit for purpose. And what we came up with was a process that takes the existing satellite data um, but actually updates it and publishes it in a way that people can easily access the area of water that was last seen by the satellite in you know, an actual physical unit that makes sense to them. Um, the last time that area you know, and that water was actually seen by a satellite, and also how recently the satellite passed over. Sometimes you can't see the water bodies because of clouds, but it's nice to know the satellite was there recently anyway. So from um, this project, we're really pleased that the outcomes have been that we've provided a really clear roadmap for Geoscience Australia about how to actually publish this information in a service, so a web feature service that's accessible to the people who need this information. Um, and even though that might take some time to implement, uh, we've actually developed enough of a solution that NAFSI can use kind of a local version of this, and so they'll be able to actually use this um, at the moment, which is wonderful. So if you have any more questions about this, you're welcome to come and chat to me. Um, you can Google DEA Maps Water Bodies if you want to have a look at the product. Thanks. Thank you, Caitlin. Next, it's our final five-minute presentation. And I'd like to welcome Sandy White from NAFSI, National Aerial Firefighting Center, and who is also an NHRA board member. She will be presenting on a project to explore the effectiveness of aerial firefighting. Thank you, Sandy. Thanks, Kat. Good afternoon, everyone. And it's my privilege to be lucky last doing our five-minute presentation today. So we're asking the question of why fly? How do we know that aerial firefighting operations are effective and efficient? And at the moment, I think it's probably fair to say we kind of sort of don't. And there's lots of different opinions. Uh, what works? What doesn't work? Should we be using helicopters? Should we be using fixed wings? Should they be big? Should they be small? And in fact, what does effectiveness mean anyway? Now, aerial firefighting is one of the most expensive aspects of response and mitigation. And we have some evidence um, that's been collected over years about the use of uh, aircraft in aviation, in, in aerial firefighting and bushfire response, but it is limited. And a, certainly a key recommendation that came out of the 2020 Royal Commission into Natural Disasters in Australia very firmly said, we have to do aerial suppression research. Now you saw from Caitlin's presentation, she touched on ARENA. ARENA is the flight management and tracking software developed um, in the National Aerial Firefighting Centre through AFAC, and it houses close to 10 years of operational flight data. And before you all get very excited, I'd like to point out that like all data, it's quite incomplete, it's got quite a few errors in it, it's not perfect, but nevertheless, there is data there. And it tells a story about how we've used aerial platforms, helicopters, aircraft 
in bushfire response where there have been flight tracking data available. So using that existing data, along with some very carefully chosen case studies, we're actually starting a project to understand how we've been using aerial, the aerial firefighting fleet in Australia and also understand the different purposes for which we've used it. I'm not a researcher, I'm here as an end user. This project has only just had the EOI closed. So we're really just beginning and we're just starting the process. We've got some overall aims where we'd really like to understand and build the, build the existing use profile of the aerial firefighting fleet. And I'll emphasise at this stage, our focus is very much on water bombing and, and, and putting water onto fire. And we're looking at it across all the Australian states, territories and landscapes. And we want to be able to understand that profile for the purposes for which those helicopters and planes are deployed and how effective that purpose has been. So why were we putting something out there in the first place? And when we sent it there, did it actually achieve the job we were asking it to do? The data will only get us so far, and the use of case studies is going to be a very important part of this work. We want to understand the reasons why we deploy, what are the expectations we have around why we deploy, and when those objectives are not met, why not? Was it because it was the wrong type of weather? Was it because it was the wrong type of platform? It got something to do with the fire behaviour? Did it have something to do with the landscape? Or was it actually because we knew that this was an impossible fire, but we were just trying to throw absolutely everything at it anyway? So we're still, as I said, we've only just closed the EOI process. This is still very much something that's just beginning. Uh, it's going to be a very important piece of work. It's going to help us really understand that aspect of our operational response and really help us understand that capability and how we can better use this capability in Australia. So thank you. Great, thank you, Sandy. So next up, it is my pleasure to welcome our final First Nations presentation of this afternoon. And I'd like to welcome Sean Hooper and Mal Ridges to the stage. They will be presenting on operationalizing Aboriginal cultural land management. Please post questions to Slido, and they will be answered during live during our First Nations yarn later this afternoon. Thank you. Yeah, I'm everybody. Um, my name's Mal Ridges. I work for the Department of Planning and Environment in New South Wales. And we work in the Science, Economics and Insights Division within that department, which is like our research division, providing research and science services to the rest of the department and supporting uh, agencies. Um, and Sean and I work in a team that undertakes cultural science. And that work's all about trying to problem solve how we bring Aboriginal people and culture into land management. And what we want to talk to you about is how we realise um, more of Aboriginal land management. But to begin that discussion, what I'd like to do is acknowledge we're under a country. But I'm going to do that a little bit differently. I'm going to ask you to help me do that. So what I want each of you to do is close your eyes. I'm just checking there's no cheaters, that everyone's got their eyes closed. Now, for the benefit of the people you're sitting next to, I'm hoping you had a wash this morning. And if you did, if you remember that water on your body, you bathed in Wurundjeri country. And unless you teleported into the room, at some point you walked Wurundjeri country. And if you're like me, you're a tea or coffee addict and drank water in that water and tea, you consumed Wurundjeri country, it's inside you. And if you go back and we're here for the welcome that Daniel gave us, if, like me, you remember the smell of that smoke 
and that smoke is still on you, I can still smell it on me, then you can smell Wurundjeri country. Now, one of the things with being welcome to country, as I understand it, is it's not just something you receive. It's something that sets you up in a reciprocal relationship. So if you can feel all those things in connection with Wurundjeri country, then what I ask you to do is give thanks. Give thanks from your heart. Thank you for helping me and Sean acknowledge Wurundjeri country. You can open your eyes. Now, I do that for a reason because understanding Aboriginal land management and supporting its growth is, it, is not just about recording Aboriginal knowledge. It's not just about lighting a fire a different way. It's not just about a different set of information that can help us manage a threatened species. It's, it's a different way of being. It's a different way of viewing the world. And the reason we wanted to do that kind of acknowledgement with you is to give you some insight into Aboriginal land management to be fully realised is really about fully realising a full expression of Aboriginal culture. And because of history, because of land tenure, before, because of a whole range of reasons, Aboriginal people haven't had that opportunity to fully realise a full expression of Aboriginal culture. So that's one of the things we're going to propose to re, um, understand in the research and what we're going to talk to you about today. Yama. My name's Sean Hooper. I'm a Wiradjuri man and a senior scientist in uh, Mal's team. Um, up on the screen here is a couple of the um, recommendations that came out of the um, state and federal inquiries. And if you look across a whole range of government department policies and documents, there's a mandate there for uh, supporting and implementing Aboriginal land and sea management uh, by Aboriginal communities. The big question is, how do we get from these recommendations and that mandate to actual uh, doing that on the ground? The way we've been sort of thinking about it is there's four challenges. The first one's a values challenge. And values are really important. If you think about all the land management and conservation policy and legislation, it's all very much based in Western ideas and values. Uh, seeing you know, the environment as a resource, uh, seeing people outside of nature, all these values that Western society has dictates how policy and legislation is formed. If we're going to introduce Aboriginal values into that, there's some things that sort of need to be thought about a bit. One of the big ones I hear is um, because a lot of uh, what scientists do and policy makers do is about knowledge, people think that it's a knowledge problem and that we need to incorporate Aboriginal knowledge into the process. But I, I kind of see it a little bit differently. There's a, a lot more to what Aboriginal people bring to the table uh, than just our knowledge. There's our values. And our values come from uh, our deep connection with Mother Earth, the country, and how we understand uh, our place in nature and uh, our relationship with nature. And I think just seeing it as a knowledge problem and just collecting or you know, engaging Aboriginal communities for their knowledge is not the full story. People also need to talk about what Aboriginal people value because what flows from that is how Aboriginal uh, ways of thinking about the world and being in relationship with the world can actually contribute to how uh, we formulate policies and land management approaches. 
And that's probably a bigger contribution that Aboriginal communities can bring to the table than just our knowledge. And in the, the values problem, um, working out how to engage uh, with that is um, very important. And it's, it's not just aside from the government or whoever might be trying to engage with Aboriginal communities around uh, values. It's also for Aboriginal communities to think about how we put that forward. Um, one of the, the things that I always sort of see is that for Aboriginal people, it's translating how we feel and understand our relationship with the world into English and words that everyone can understand, do then in a way that's considered uh, valid and authentic, and um, make that sort of contribution, uh, you know, because um, we're always expected to turn up at a meeting and, you know, just deliver all of our knowledge and everything oops, sorry, um, straight into the process. But there are cultural sort of frameworks that um, need to be sort of seen. So one of the important elements of the, the values challenge is how do we do that, both from an Aboriginal community perspective, but also from uh, government. Yeah, another challenge here is a policy challenge. And we already had an example of that this morning. If I refer back to when Daniel welcomed us to Wurundjeri country, you may remember he had the fire and the leaves on that dish. And that dish was made from the burl of a tree. And he had to get a permit to cut that burl off that tree. That's an example of the policy challenge. I'll give you another example from one that I'm familiar with. Um, I've been working for about 10 years with Uluroi, uh, Uluroi people out near Walgett and Lightning Ridge in New South Wales at a place on the map that's called Narran Lake. But culturally, it's known as Derua. That place is a Ramsar wetland of international significance. It's had some of the largest colonies of ibis uh, recorded in Australia. But it's also an important cultural landscape. It's got cultural values in terms of its heritage, but also cultural values in terms of its story. Now that place is important because there are connections between those people and the ibis, for example, at that place. And one of the interesting things that um, occurs is there's a lot of science undertaken at that lake to record how many birds there are, to record how much water there is, response of the vegetation and the animals, and it's a place that's regularly monitored. But one of the implications of that is it's very rule driven. So even when the Aboriginal community have been out participating in that uh, uh, monitoring, they can't go within a certain distance of a nest. Um, they certainly can't uh, take uh, anything from those nests for those ibis. And as a result, there's like this barrier between them and the ibis, even though they're culturally connected. The interesting thing there with the ibis is it usually lays three to four eggs each time it nests. And it kicks out one or two of those eggs and chooses one or two to focus on, which become the chicks. Now, speaking with the elders from that community, they explained that those one or two eggs that get kicked out are a gift from the ibis. And so there's always a cultural practice of harvesting eggs and consuming them. And the consumption of the eggs is not just not a monitoring thing. You're going to inspect the nest, see how the bird's going. But the consumption of the egg is important because, like I was uh, referring to earlier about how you connect it with country, you connect through the consumption as well. And so this is an example where there's all these rules in place that complicate the actual practice of Aboriginal culture. And if we want to see a full expression of Aboriginal land management, these policy challenges need to be worked through so that we can see a full expression of Aboriginal land management. The other challenge that we face is the implementation challenge. Um, this is quite a, a big challenge because uh, there's a lot of different aspects to it. 
Um, I'll just touch on a few of the aspects that are important. One of the, the big aspects is um, there's that expectation that um, Aboriginal communities, you know, compile their knowledge and values and approaches and bring them to the table and, um, you know, it's all worked through. But everyone else sitting at that table has massive resources. They have departments and computers and people doing all sorts of specific jobs. And most Aboriginal communities don't have anywhere near those resources. So there's a massive task to look at how we can facilitate Aboriginal uh, communities to build those, those, um, uh, uh, that capacity to sort of, you know, assist in uh, telling the story. The other big important aspect of the implementation challenge is understanding from a government perspective how we can facilitate communities to undertake the practice of Aboriginal land management because Aboriginal land management has a lot more functions than just doing stuff in the bush. It actually is a major way that we uh, intergenerationally transfer our knowledge by going out in the bush and bringing the kids and everything. That's the way we teach and pass on our knowledge. So it's not just a matter of uh, doing work out in the bush, it's actually a cultural process. So understanding how we can facilitate that is the implementation problem. And lastly is the reporting challenge. Now, if I imagine everybody in this room has had a grant or funding of some point and faced the reporting challenge. But um, the kind of reporting challenge we're, we're talking about here, there was a, um, a review of the um, Caring for Country program uh, quite a long time ago. And one of the things that they identified was people were reporting things that were like, you know, how many hectares were sprayed, what length of fencing was put in, how many animals were, you know, uh, pests were removed. There was lots of reporting of activity, but actually reporting the outcome was difficult. So in the Aboriginal land management space, how do you report the outcome? Now, to illustrate this, I'll, I'll describe a project we did in southwest New South Wales, near Mungo National Park. And we were, um, had a uh, program there to go and look at mallee And mallee in that landscape are a threatened species. Um, we got our funding in 2013. Later that year, a fire went through the research site, completely fried the place. No more mallee they all took off. So for three years, we thought we we're going to go do count how many mallee that were there, how many active nests, go find some new nests, go around playing with LIDAR and all sorts of things. Um, there was no mallee fowl. The whole point of the project, though, was to bring a culturally centred uh, approach to the project. And on the surface, that seemed simple. But actually, what it turned out to be was um, how do we prepare for the return of mallee fowl? So it wasn't actually about the mallee fowl, it ended up turning into a project about us and how we put cultural fire back into that landscape in a cultural way. And to understand how to do that cultural fire concerned our values and how we burn, what our attitude to fire was. So when we light that fire, we light in an appropriate way that's informed by values. To learn those values, what emerged in that project was a ceremony. It was a ceremony for Mellifer. And in that ceremony, uh, the elders in the project taught all the participants about these values and they, can, they were continually being reinforced through that ceremony. And everybody who came and participated in that project went through the ceremony. So actually what turned out was that the most important part of the project, culturally, the cultural outcome, was the rejuvenation of the ceremony. Because that changed the people. And when the people changed, we started caring for the place differently. And just recently, two years after the end of the project, Mallee Fowler started to come back. So this is an example where you know, the, the reporting challenge is actually understanding the real outcomes of Aboriginal land management and how we describe them and catch them to tell the story about what difference it makes and what the benefits are. And in summary, if we start doing all those things, we start to solve some of these challenges and the research we're proposing to do is to understand each of these challenges, then we're going to be in a much better place to scope and um, find a pathway 
to realising Aboriginal land management on a much larger scale. Because if we do, what you're really talking about is a different relationship between all of us and country. And the, the, the hook there with the disaster management is just something, we're not, we're not separate from the system, the environment, we're part of it. And that means we've got to build that relationship. If we do, we're on a different pathway to resilience for natural disasters, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Mal. Thank you, Sean. And I had the privilege of actually attending the Mali Fowl ceremony, and Lisa, who's here as well, was, was with us. And um, I can confirm that it was a profound experience, um, deep reflection, and, yeah, forever changed because of that, for the better, because of that ceremony. So, yeah, thank you. So um, it's afternoon tea time, so thank you to all the speakers. Thank you to everyone for listening and please enjoy some afternoon tea. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>